Our speaker today is Gary Talbot. Uh, he is an IT engineer with over 35 years of experience, even though he doesn't look old enough to have been in the business 35 years, multiple aspects of technology. His long career has included service to the U.S. government, heading operations in support of wartime and counterterrorism efforts. Gary has also worked for years developing complex solutions ranging from surveillance systems to forensic investigation for international governments, agencies, and commercial organizations. Interestingly, he is also a musician, songwriter, martial arts instructor, bringing a unique and multifaceted perspective to discussions about life, technology, and self-enrichment. Currently, his sights are set on industry movements in biometrics and MDL, which is Mobile Driver's License, a technology as individual states within the U.S. begin to make their moves towards this new standard. This is a brief lecture about one man's journey into technology, his perspectives on a new tech that may soon impact how we do things. Let's give a warm welcome, warm rotary welcome to Gary Talbot. My name is Gary Talbot, and I'm here to give you a lecture on um, that's titled uh, Life, Biometrics, Artificial Intelligence, Conspiracy Theories, and Digital Identity. So I like to think that's a pretty provocative title. I um, wanted to throw in alien abduction in there somewhere, but I didn't think I have enough time to roll that into the overall presentation. But uh, normally when I give open forum speeches like this, it tends to be about martial arts or music or some type of self-motivation or positivity. So I tend to be a really positive person. And if that becomes really annoying, you can blame Sterling for that because he's the one who invited me here. But um, I am actually a technologist. Uh, I'm not pretending to be one. My current title uh, is with a company called Idemia. And uh, for them, I'm the director of solutions innovation. And for those who don't know who Idemia is, when you travel through the airport and you're stuck in security, if you look around, you'll see the Idemia logo. They actually provide a lot of the equipment for TSA. Uh, we've provided an, a new modernized global entry system, a biometric global entry system for Border Patrol. Um, Idemia is the number one manufacturer of technology for driver's licenses for fraud prevention. So they have their, their fingertips in a lot of different stuff. And they're considered uh, in the big three of biometric solution providers. So that's the soup that I swim in on a, a daily basis. So what I'm going to try and do is tie all these aspects of, of this uh, presentation together and give you some understanding of underlying technologies that lead to digital identity and ultimately MDL. Uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself in that process as well. So I myself did not um, start out as a technologist. I uh, did very poorly in school. I barely made it through high school. Um, my greatest uh, collegiate uh, achievement was uh, a scholastic achievement and uh, was to get the high score on the video game on the second floor cafeteria, the Robotron machine. So ah, he knows what I'm talking about. And um, other than that, I, it was because I had actually been taught in for for so many reasons that I really had uh, didn't have a propensity for learning, especially science and technology. And so I pursued music and other creative endeavors in, in the early part of my 20s. And the reason you've never seen my face before is because none of my music was ever released despite having a couple of record deals. So a friend of mine feeling sympathetic for me got me a job with a company called Cable and Wireless Communications. Those that know telecommunications, that's a huge company. And they hired me as a low-level analyst for that environment. And they were very good about offering um, courses to people on the lowest rung to give them a chance to maybe learn or, or elevate themselves or rise, rise through the system. I myself saw that as an opportunity to get out of work for about a week. So I took them up on the opportunity and the first class I took was a class on time division multiplexing. And, and, and time division multiplexing is relevant to our conversation because it's part of the process of going from analog to digital circuits. Analog to digital conversion, once you have something in a digital package, you can do a lot of things with it. And in telecommunications, that's really important because you don't have that loss of fidelity that you would have with an analog signal were you to transmit it long distance when you move to digital format. So um, during this course, 
oddly, for some reason, which I've actually spoken about in in, in other other venues, uh, I had an epiphany. It actually woke my brain in a very odd and unexpected way. And sitting in this class, this poor instructor is looking at me as I'm literally crying in class because I've just understood how to learn. And suddenly technology was easy for me. I started studying coding and, and, and uh, uh, storage engineering and network engineering and Unix operating systems, anything I could get my hand on, physics and science. And it became the center of my world. And I became this jack of all trades in technology. So that, uh, I'm old. So <laughs> uh, long ago when you were the jack of all trades for technology, uh, they called you a solution architect. And that is the job that I acquired doing a lot of federal jobs, working for uh, Department of Homeland Security, a lot of three-letter agencies, and even some commercial projects for many years until one day somebody came to me and said, hey, we would like you to be what we're calling the global solution architect for a biometric system that we're building for the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That was my introduction to biometrics. And that is quite a story. But <laughs> let's talk about biometrics and what they are to get everybody on the same page, okay? Biometrics are anything that can identify you physically. So most people are accustomed to fingerprints or face, but that includes DNA. That includes tattoos, actually, are considered biometric. Uh, that includes the gait in which you walk, all kinds of stuff, and your, vo your vocal print as well. So... Uh, these are called different modalities in biometrics. And uh, when by in and of themselves, they can identify a person, but combined, multiple biometrics combined, can actually uh, really give you an assurance of the individual that you're trying to identify. So um, uh, biometrics are very related also to the topic that we're discussing because biometrics combined with digital identity creates a very powerful paradigm. So to create a good biometric system, you uh, really have three components that you want to look at. Uh, one is the enrollment process of getting really good quality individuals into a database, recording them, whether it's an iris scan or a face scan, really good quality images. Second is uh, the acquisition stage when you're acquiring someone in the field. And third is the matching stage. And that's really critical. You have to get very smart people to do the math, to create algorithms, that will match these entities to the backend system. And early on, uh, the, it, was very, um, it was very good, but there were criticisms that the biometric algorithms were not very good at capturing people of color. And uh, there was some truth to that. In fact, they would actually call them racist biometric algorithms. I might have a problem with that title, but nonetheless, it raised concerns that alerted the biometric community Okay, so we have biometric systems and we want algorithms to match people. And there's been criticism in the industry about these algorithms. Well, because of the advancements in hardware, uh, this is, includes machine vision cameras, high definition cameras, and artificial intelligence, we had the processing power to start leveraging artificial intelligence platforms like deep learning and machine learning, especially for facial recognition, that really changed the game. So more than ever, we are wildly accurate on identifying people within a biometric database. And in fact, capturing people, we literally now have algorithms that while you're wearing a mask, we can still identify. You. We do uh, tests with the Bar Department of Homeland Security where we uh, uh, do people in masks, people with uh, glasses on even, and people moving very quickly through things, and uh, we still are able to capture them. So now we're very, very accurate at identifying people, especially during with facial recognition. And what that does is that alarms people. As because some of you, I can already tell in your faces are frowning. It alarms people, and that leads to the conspiracy theories that arise out of that. And I grabbed a number of different headlines, so you can, you're welcome to peruse that. But um, the main concern is that people are worried about the Orwellian state, that the government is becoming too overreaching, that they can use these systems to track us and know everything that we're doing and the black helicopters are coming. And so um, that was uh, because of that, people like myself who put together biometric systems can't ignore 
the complaints that people have. Even if from a technical perspective, I know that there's not a lot of merit there. My job is to alleviate the concerns, especially of U.S. citizens. And so even if it looks like it's not something that's going to impact how we technically do things, how do we position the systems to make people comfortable and feel safe? Now, I will say from a personal perspective, I worked on a lot of biometric systems for a lot of purposes, including counterterrorism and, and surveillance and everything you can think of. Every time, I should specify, in the United States, <laughs> every time that I have worked on a system, it has been a mantra within our project that we need to preserve PII, which is personally identifiable information, and build an ethical system that protects the rights of U.S. citizens. And that is not a joke. Like, it is taken very, very seriously. So I think, at least in my career, we've done a really good job of doing that. And um, a lot of it is because of listening to the concerns of people who come off as conspiracy theorists. But in reality, sometimes they have some very good points. So we've got biometric systems, we've got algorithms, we've got pushback from people. Uh, some of that pushback, by the way, that led to certain states outlawing uh, the use of facial recognition systems at New York, Florida, Washington State, and others, West Virginia, that wouldn't allow facial recognition systems to be uh, implemented. Um, eventually, the um, people started to realize something. We were associating biometric systems with criminal activity and catching criminals. But because of technology and mobile phones and the social media and things, people are starting to realize that biometric systems can offer a level of safety and a, a, an incredible um, ease of use uh, if we implement them properly, properly and safely. So the, the, the mood is starting to change across America, especially, uh, internationally really, uh, I think internationally, they're a little further along than the U.S. And so uh, we're starting to see the doors open and we're able to do these. And so I'm going to tie those biometric systems to the digital identity and why that matters. OK, so what is uh, uh, an MDL, mobile driver's license? There's a description up there that I grabbed from the AMVO website. Uh, and at the end of the day, it says that uh, a mobile driver's license is a digital ID that's stored on your mobile phone that can be updated in real time that has all the same variables and attributes in it as your regular driver's license. Um, but uh, you are in control of it. It sits on your phone and you can delete it or recreate it as you wish. The uh, way that you use a mobile driver's license is you go to a vendor, which we tend to call um, relying parties, and you scan your ID. And there's never that... I'm handing you this piece of plastic thing. Here's all of my information. It's all done through a, ver a verifier that securely authenticates your driver's license and makes sure that it's valid. And how it does that is kind of complex. We don't have enough time to go into the technology, but it uses uh, something called asynchronous uh, key encryption in order to assure the validity of each of these licenses. Um, in order to do that properly, you have to have standards so everybody's doing the same thing. So those standards are governed by the International uh, Organization of, of uh, Standardization and the International Electrotechnical Commission uh, under 18013-5. 18013-7 uh, is coming out, I think, in about a year, and uh, that will extend uh, the standards around mobile uh, driver's license. And AMVA, the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators, that is a nonprofit organization that provides tools and services to... Uh, DMVs in Canada and the United States. Uh, so we combine those standards in order to um, govern how mobile driver licenses are managed. So the ecosystem is such that you will literally, and, and there's actually a picture up there that is the uh, picture of the mobile driver's license application that is distributed by Idemia. It looks just like that. Um, you will actually download an app to your phone and tell if it'll be specific to your DMV. Uh, tell them you want to create a mobile driver's license. It'll scan the front and back of your license and take a selfie of you. You submit those to the DMV, and through magic, they determine whether or not you are who you say you are. Uh, and if you have any questions when we get to question and answer, I'll tell you a little bit about what that magic is. Um, 
Uh, nonetheless, they then send you an encrypted package, which is your certified ID, and it sits on your phone. Were you to get a new phone, you'll have to recreate it because it travels with your phone, and they can delete it at will anytime they wish. Um, if you want to use it, then let's say you decide to go to the ABC store to get a bottle of vodka to celebrate the fact that you got a new mobile driver's license. When you go there, you would merely tap your phone on a verifier device at the ABC store, and it would only tell the person behind the desk that you're over 21. They don't know your name. They don't know where you live. They don't know anything about you other than what they need to know. That is why people are pushing for mobile driver's license. It provides more security for the, for the DMV, more security for the individual holding the driver's license, and more security for the clerk or the vendor who wants to read it and get information off of it. So everybody wins. Now, TSA right now is the biggest use case. And uh, I do have a slide later on that shows the distribution across TSA where you can actually right now, if you have a mobile ID, use it in an airport. So these are the DMVs that IDEMIA is currently working with, uh, six of them up there. There are more that I am personally working with that I can't tell you right now. Uh, that's a secret, but uh, they're on the way. And um, they actually have working MDL um, systems right now. In addition, not on that list is Maryland. Maryland recently came out with a mobile driver's license. So some of you may have it. If you don't, you have the ability to kind of dive into this technology. Uh, this is a map that represents the airports across the United States that currently are accepting MDLs. And they accept those MDLs on what are called CAT2 machines that uh, we provide to TSA as, as, as technology. And you, uh, it has a camera on it and using a special QR code, it'll actually read your ID. Uh, so it's quite interesting. And as you can see, it's not everywhere, but it's starting to spread out. So we're really at the infancy of this technology. All right. And this is AMVA's um, map on the record they have for DMVs that are currently using this technology. And uh, the, there's about 10 DMVs that they have on record across the country. Uh, including Canada, that are have active MDL programs. Uh, there's four more that are working on it, but haven't released them yet. And 11 that are going through the litigation process of being able to um, put these driver's licenses in place, uh, digital driver's licenses in place. Um, uh, there are a little more than that. It's, it's ever shifting. Um, but overall, you can see this is how we're, um, this is where uh, our status quo at the moment. The question is, what is the future of this? And obviously it's at its infancy. I think we got another year at least, maybe two, before we start seeing them on everybody's phone. But you're gonna start seeing companies like Samsung and Google and Apple already that, have, that are gonna start advertising that they support these products on your phone. And it's gonna change the way that we actually use our IDs. The idea is, is you don't need a wallet anymore. So you won't have to have a wallet to hold all of your credit cards or your license or your driver's license or any of that. All of that will exist on your phone, which we've already adopted into our lives. Uh, so it creates a much more secure environment for us. And I think it also opens the door for those of you that are entrepreneurial because the, these new technologies haven't been completely leveraged yet. We don't know who the big vendors will be that are distributing these verifiers and that will be on sitting on top of this technology. So that's all I have for this, unless there are questions that you have. Hi, uh, Christian right. Martin. I actually lead the authentication and identification for Glassdoor. We're relatively early in this process. And the question I have for you is the the systems that you presented MDL and the technology underneath it, how do you anticipate that private businesses will be able to leverage the fact that people can be verified, but only take those pieces that they need similar to how TSA is operating today? So how will vendors... Uh restrict their information or so an example if someone is creating an account on a website and all you need to know is that they are a real person mm -hmm. and that the person behind the screen is the real person 
that is verified, but the business doesn't need to know who that is, the name of that person. Yeah. Where are we on that uh, trajectory? So the, the interesting part about that is the power for that actually lies with the person holding the ID. So as you are prompted, part of the specification is that person has to be prompted uh, by the vendor and they literally get a message that says, this person wants this information about you. Are you okay with that? So you actually have the ability to reject the transaction and say, you don't need to know this about me. So it, it forces vendors to do the research up front to say, uh, per my clientele, what are they okay with? And um, uh, it's kind of a negotiation that is yet to happen, but will have to happen kind of up front for those transactions. But the power is with the person holding the ID completely. Um, you mentioned, I think, in the beginning of your talk that you worked with Saudi Arabia, which kind of brings up the whole ethics question. I yes. mean, in the U.S., at least right now, I trust our government. <laughs> but do you, I mean, do you restrict who you sell this technology to? Do you worry about what you're doing? Um, yes, absolutely. So I, I, I speak for Idemia when I say uh, Idemia does have, um, uh, Idemia was not involved in my specific project in Saudi Arabia, but Idemia does have offices in Saudi Arabia and they do worry about the ethical impact of, of, of those kinds of things. Um, I do have interesting stories about my time in Saudi Arabia. I, it's a very interesting place. I was actually in Riyadh, which is of, of the places in Saudi Arabia, one of the most interesting, I think. But, um, and we did have questions to some degree about how they would leverage those systems. And, um, uh, but in the United States, we haven't had as much. But there's a lot I could say about Saudi Arabia and worrying about ethics and how the treatment of women and, and their citizens in general. So, I learned a lot while I was there, for sure. In a place like Saudi Arabia, raising your concerns about those ethical things only gets you so far. But in the United States, it gets you much farther because when you raise concerns, people have to take them seriously. Uh, so they, they, I will say the folks I did interact with in Saudi, they, um, they did have concern. I don't think it was the same way that the United States looks at it. And we didn't have the authority to push any issues. So it was a, a, a sticky situation. Yeah, in your presentation, you presented an American reality with all the situations by state. The U.S. is one of the few countries that does not have a national ID. Correct. So maybe Saudi Arabia is the case, but uh, I could see this easily integrated at a national level. Could you comment on how you see this solution uh, being applied by a country, say, Brazil or Mexico that have national Well, IDs. yeah, yeah, absolutely. In fact, we talk all the time. Uh, uh, Idemia as a country, as a company is actually based in France. And so I interact with uh, the uh, Polish, French and Italian branches of Idemia all the time. And so this standard is an international standard for MID. So there is an, a kind of an international agreement on how to manage and how to transmit mobile IDs. Um, and, and as long as everyone continues to follow those standards and respect those standards, then they are digestible abroad uh, as well as within the United States. Mr. Talbot, our club has a tradition that we plant a tree and give you a certificate in honor of your speaking today. And the, the uh, tree has a coordinates that you can find it. I'm not sure how you do that, but it's <laughs> there. And um, you also get a beautiful pin. So with that with good health. And, and thank you so much. You really enlightened us.